problem of demonstrating the existence of, and our knowledge and our understanding of the external world is to show how or why skepticism about the external world is not correct. Right? That, obviously, we can know something about the external world, but before we get to that, we have to understand the nature of the problem itself. Okay, so it should be clear what we're doing here. All right, um, so number two, we, that makes sense, right? Shout is not attempting to locate a solution for this problem. He's trying to understand the nature of the problem, right? There must be an attempt to understand epistemological epistemological skepticism. He calls it skepticism about the external world. That's too much to write. So I'll just put epistemological skepticism. There must be an attempt to understand the propensity within a perceiver to want to deny the existence of the external world, to want to be skeptical about the existence of the external world. If we're to defend the existence of the external world, you can't really do that until you've demonstrated um, that, no, there is a legitimate reason to believe, right, to believe. Okay, and then finally, number three, goal to understand the physical, um, philosophical problem of our knowledge of the external world. Right? What is the nature of our philosophical problem, of the philosophical problem of coming to understand? It's, it's quite obviously difficult, right? So let me just begin, so I'll put understanding question mark. Right? What is the nature, number three, to understand the philosophical problem of our knowledge of the external world, right? Okay, um, before I begin, I want to read a little bit out of this uh, section. This is on page seven. Um, and this is a pretty interesting section. It begins with reflection. If you have the exact book, it's the second column, basically third paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a bit. Reflection on our investigation of our um, putative knowledge need not always extend to a wide area of interest. It might be important to ask whether some specific and particular thing I believe or have been taking for granted is really something I know. Right? It comes, there comes a point in time when we transition from a very sort of infantile, immature mentality, epistemologically speaking, to a more mature epistemological understanding. And what in the world do I mean by that? <clears throat> First off, you guys know that when I do my lecture series, I sort of incorporate my own interpretations into the interpretations of the author. So I'm not, you know, I don't just tell you what the author says. Um, I conceptualize what the author says, and then I interpret it in a way that is, that's suitable to me. So I'm not necessarily attributing these ideas to the author themselves. This is a combination of the author plus myself. <clears throat> Think of it in this term, right? I was thinking about it uh, on the drive over here to determine how I was going to explain this, but it's very simple. Imagine that a child at a very young age is, is told by his or her parent that the external world outside, the world literally outside the confines of the home, is a very hostile world, is a very dangerous world is a very selfish world. It's a world filled with greed and hate. Right? And the child, because the child respects and admires and trusts, primarily, in the parent's ability, comes to condition his or her interpretation of that fact. So that when the child gets a little older and leaves the house, the confines of the house, we believe in some sense that the very specific instances of things that occur in my day-to-day -day life are going to be made sense of, are going to attribute meaning by the way in which I was conditioned to think. Right? If I was conditioned, this is very important, right? And I, uh, hopefully this is really, really general, but I, there are going to be huge impacts for this much later, right? If I am conditioned to believe that the external world is a very hostile, negative, dangerous, greed-filled, lust-filled, anger-filled place, then once I leave after this conditioning and I see instances of anger and aggression and 
abuse of power and authority, I am going to use those facts to condition the way in which I, to, to not condition, to um, legitimize my conditioning. This is a very sort of general sense, super general. We're not talking even about objects yet, right? That's way too advanced. So we're just really thinking, and this, this should make sense, right? Okay. Another child, just to speed it along a bit, another child is told that the world is a place of plenty and that there's opportunity in the world and you have to be the sort of person that recognizes and has the ability to identify opportunity that other people might not see. Um, and insofar as you identify opportunity that others might not see, you can, you can utilize skill to bring you power, to bring you knowledge, to bring you wealth, to bring you esteem, what have you. The child is conditioned in this way. The child goes into the world with this conditioning. The child sees maybe irregularities or abuses or gaps, and the child monopolizes that opportunity takes total control of that opportunity in order to bring himself, herself, the things that he or she most wants, right? Two different ways of acting in the world. The meaning that is attributed to the individual's life, because later, this, much, much later, this will lead towards a, a profoundly more advanced concept of sort of being, right? The way in which we are in the world. And also, by the way, I'm going to do both an analytic and a continental spin on, on, um, on epistemology. It's not just going to be a continental. I am going to do sort of a hardcore analytic account of epistemology, but I want to create a grand narrative so that people... This is the second installment. So we've got to progress slowly. So the idea is, just as an example, two different cases, both contingent on um, conditioning, both children leave in... in, in venture into the external world, specific instances, specific observations, specific perceptions from either individual is internalized and interpreted different because of the way in which, the conditioning, the way in which the individual had been conditioned to see things, right? What we immediately recognize then is that there's some ambiguity to the truth then, that this idea of truth becomes a bit ambiguous, the nature of the world with respect to, and, I, and before we get to uh, the, objective, the, the objective level, I want you to understand this sort of subjectively, because I, don't, I can't assess the level of training that each of you have, I have to keep it as general as possible, but just in a sort of a gut sense, it makes sense to say, well, no, there is some legitimate grounds for critique. If you agree with what I just said, with the two examples that I just gave, then you recognize that, well, it's not... It's not totally false that the first child views the world in a very pessimistic sense. And it's not totally false that the second child views the world in an optimistic sense, just to generalize. And it's also not totally true or totally true, right? There's some ambiguity to the nature of the world. We start to recognize in a very skeptical, obvious manner that there is interpretation and that interpretation factors into our knowledge. And that's what's key. Interpretation factors into our... This is going to become really, really, really important much, much, much later in the lecture series. But from now, for those of you who are following along, you know, I would recommend to keep really detailed notes. If you're being, if you're going to be serious about the epistemology series, get your own you know, yellow pad, white pad, bring out your iPad, <laughs> and, uh, you know, take notes, because this is going to be a very important point, right? Interpretation factors into our knowledge. It means something, right? It's not just incidental. The way in which we interpret the world isn't an incidental factor into the acquisition of knowledge. The way in which we interpret the world becomes necessarily powerful. It becomes a meaningful way in which we acquire knowledge. It becomes a meaningful way with which we engage the external world. Okay, so um, that covers that. Sort of really basic general description. The next is the following. The epistemological origins of skepticism about the external world. Okay, so here we have our perceiver. Right? So we have a perceiver, and the perceiver 
is 